Welcome to the Perspectives on IBC series where advisor Chris Tormey joins me in a discussion on all things related to the infinite banking concept. In this educational series, you'll learn the basics of IBC and how you can recapture the financing function in your life so you can gain more control and freedom of your wealth. So welcome Perennial Pride listeners. Thanks for joining me on this podcast today. I'm here with my friend and fellow advisor, Chris Tormey from Monaco Advisors. He's a good friend of mine and uh, really happy to have him on this, this unique series we're going to start doing on the infinite banking concept. You may have heard this in, across the social media and, or some friends. It's kind of this mystical uh, idea that's it's it's uh, around the financial space and and so Chris and I want to step back from a moment and and, and share our thoughts around it uh, provide some education and try to simplify this concept right there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings of it it sounds sexy but it's it's not an actual bank right so we we just want to uh, spend some time going through our perspective on it, sharing some insights from the originator, R. Nelson Nash, and, and the Becoming Your Own Bank Banker book. So it's something I would highly encourage you to read, regardless if you go through this, this series. But uh, this is where we want to set the tone and share it in chunks that are hopefully digestible and give you some, some good concepts to, to build off of and learn from this. So Chris, first, thanks for joining me on this uh, series. Hey, Tom, thanks very much for having me. I really look forward to the conversation. Um, it's, it's an area, infinite banking concept. It's an area that I've been uh, interested in and involved in very much in my planning career for the near, near a decade now. And um, very happy to go through some of the framework and, and uh, foundations of, uh, of this concept. That's great. Yeah. And we'll try to simplify it because it's you know, we could get so mired in the weeds, but, you know, we just have to understand how it fits as a strategy in our overall life, right? And not just finances, but overall life in terms of giving us freedom to do what we want. And that's really the heart of it, at least for me, it is. So let's step back and say it's infinite banking concept. It's a book, Becoming Your Own Banker. But there's also a, a foundation that's sort of built around this, right? It isn't just a book or an individual. It's kind of gotten a life of its own now right, through the Nelson Nash Institute. So let's start there for a moment, Chris. You can talk a little bit about the, the foundation itself and maybe some background on that. Sure, absolutely. So Nelson Nash coined the term infinite banking concept and practiced this uh, technique of financing his own life uh, and, and spread this word to others, really starting back in the uh, 1980s. We lost Nelson Nash in 2019. Uh, he passed on, but the Institute uh, continues to power on with his son-in-law, David Stearns, a business uh, consultant named Carlos Lara, and a third gentleman, Bob Murphy, who is a an economist in, in the area of Austrian economics, which is a whole nother topic, but it's a topic around how economies work, how money works. And those three together carry the torch for Nelson. So what, what Nelson came to, to see and believe actually started when he was a forester. He bought uh, land and, and planted trees and, and, uh, and, and waited for those trees to grow large enough to, uh, to, to sell into paper mills and uh, construction uh, for, uh, for, for homes. And what he saw as a forester is, you know, the, the value of, of planting and nurturing and, and growing, you know, something that can be, you know, very, very valuable down the road and years time out. And um, he became involved in the insurance industry through that. And uh, there's actually an insurance company, Foresters, who, who Tom and I both know, uh, that actually practices uh, uh, or has the IBC concept in its um, mutual life policies uh, as well. So that's just a little bit of a background of a really a very, very interesting and I think in, in, in many ways great man's life and how he brought this concept uh, to life for all of us. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And there's, there's rules around it. We'll get into it as part of this whole series uh, for sure, a lot more detail be, behind it, but it's, it is quite amazing. There's 
there's a program, there's training specifically for it that to, to be a practitioner. So there's a lot of structure and organization because they want to make sure that uh, the, the concepts that Nelson had put forth here were, were adhered to and sort of pushed forward in a, in a um, you know, a, a truthful and educational manner. So it's, it's really a, a great organization. Um, yeah. So with, on that note, you know, this is this is where, you know, when we start with IBC, where we want to kind of spend more of the time on, at least on this this particular uh, podcast and, and section, is what is IBC? What's the infinite banking concept? And so when you think of it broadly, back to Chris, what Chris, you were mentioning, is, is basically owning that banking function of in your life. And, and we call it privatized banking, right? Banking, there was a Bill Gates quote was, Banking is necessary, but banks are not. And this is a true nature of how this whole concept came to be is, is understanding we need banking and financing for a whole host of things in our lives, from purchases to investments. But how do you do that and how do you gain control of that? And it, started, it starts with recognizing there's another vehicle that can help you and platform to do it. And that's permanent cash value life insurance, whole life insurance, which people have very strong opinions of pluses or minuses. So we're going to try to demystify all of that as part of this. So Chris, anything to add to that from your lens, just as in terms of a starting point for what, what is IBC and or the infinite banking concept? Yeah, I guess the, the one thing I'd add is, um, you know, the, the banking institution and banks are in the news again, you know, last, last week we're, 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 uh, talking today on March 17th, just last week, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, the, the second largest uh, bank failure in history, uh, only rivaled by Washington Mutual back in 2008, uh, failed for a totally different reason. Back in 2008, it was mortgage uh, default related. Um, subprime loans was the talk. In, in this case, it's basically the Fed's uh, trying to fight inflation with higher and higher interest rates. And so the assets on bank portfolios are going down because they're fixed in, in their rates. And it brings up the, the, the idea, in my mind at least, that banks serve two major functions in the economy. One, for them, is really a loss leader, and for us is an absolutely wonderful thing, and that is processing payments. So income, our paychecks from our companies that we work for, our clients, um, if, if we're working as our own business, and that's processed through a bank. And then out go all the many, many flows to the credit card companies, to the utilities, to, to, you know, to everyone that we uh, use to have, have a nice life. So payment processing is something that we rely on the banks for, and they're wonderful at it. The second area, this kind of circles back to IBC and to Silicon Valley Bank, is they take our deposits, so those things that aren't flowing but are, are in our mind at least, sitting there at the bank, and those deposits don't do anything of the sort sit there at the bank. They actually are taken by the bank to be lent out to mortgages, to car loans, to business loans, et cetera, et cetera. So they are the banking system is established on something called a fractional reserve banking system. And the theory is if a bank's got a billion dollars of deposits, there's no way more than 50 million or 100 million at the most is going to be demanded to be withdrawn at any moment in time. So they can take the other 950 million of that billion and lend it out. And this is the area that I think Nelson Nash and certainly um, the Nelson Nash Institute looks at and says, would we like to partner with someone different than as an alternative, not for the payment processing part, but for the uh, location of our deposits, of our holdings of cash that we want to use when we see the opportunity or when we have the emergency with no risk of uh, it not being there available for us. So that's the area of the banking system that Nelson felt that uh, a partnership with a mutual uh, whole life insurance company could serve the depositor, if we're going to use that same word for both, could serve the depositor better. 
in a number of different ways. And that's what the Nelson Nash Institute, that's the, that's the information that, that basically explains how that happens. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. And, and we all do need somewhere to store our wealth. And we're just so accustomed to putting every dollar that comes through income or whatever source, however you make your money into the bank, right? That's just the natural progression of it. So we just have grown accustomed to it. And yes. so this one does turn it a little bit on the side and say, well, is there a better place to store our wealth that's safe and accessible and can actually be productive? Obviously, you know, bank rates, notwithstanding what's happening today, are typically you're not really getting much from mm -hmm. it. You're not earning all that much interest, but it, it provides a place to, to stash it and you won't lose it. And then you can start using it down the road. So we're just used to that. Now, today, you know, we say savings and we always talk about we need to save. I think everyone recognizes our need to save money, right? And that's, it's, you know, hopefully we have extra cash uh, left over after our expenses. That's a different discussion around cash flow, but we have money to save somewhere and build up, but we've commingled that with investing, which comes with risk, right? We want to save and everyone says, oh, I'm putting my money into a retirement savings account. Well, that's at risk, right? It's an investment. And so we're talking about where to save, but you know, let's let's step back a second and say, okay, what would we talk about? We're talking about investments, right? What would be if you were to paint the picture of a perfect investment? What are some of the characteristics that would you want it to have? Yes. Uh, well, if I were to you know start by you know thinking in the ideal, how about a good return so that my investment grows over time? And I'd like a good return consistently, so there's not a lot of anxiety around the return, the roller coaster ride that we can see in some places. So that that would be one. I'll just try a second one, and maybe you could jump in after that. Yeah. I'd like it to be, uh, you know, low or no taxes. If there's if there's taxes on it, then all of a sudden whatever the return is is diminished by whatever the tax rate is. So those are two things I, I look at and think about a lot in terms of a, a good investment. Yeah. And, and, you know, in this world where you can't find it, I, 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 you know, obviously you want it accessible. I'd love to have access to my money, right? When I want it or need it. All right. That would be ideal for me. I mean, it's earning and, you know, I don't want to have to wait 30, 40 years to use it. You know, I'd love to have access to it if I wanted to pretty easily. You know, I, I certainly from my lens, I mean, there's a lot of Financial strategies, are, they're built on a lot of hope and what it could be in terms of returns. I'd love to have guarantees tied to it, right? What is that, what, what am I guaranteed to get out of that investment? You know, this day and age, it's, uh, there are very few of those opportunities, but I'd love to know that I'm going to end up with some dollar to be able to fund college or retirement. Are there any guarantees tied to it? I, I, I would certainly would want that. Sure. I guess also, you know, unless cash is sitting in your wallet or in, in the home somewhere, there's some sort of partnership, right? You're going to be putting that cash with an external entity. And I'd want that external entity to be trustworthy and to have a, a, a record that I can look at and, and, and like. And I'd like that, that partner, if you will, uh, to be uh, very open with me about uh, where my cash is when, you know, when it's growing, while it's growing. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, the time recording and, and, you know, there's certainly a lot of volatility in our world, in our economy, you know, and it's causing people stress. You know, that can be very stressful. I'd love to have no market volatility. Right. My investment does its job and it does it in one direction. We love yeah. that. Right. You know, I know in the world of risk, we, we you know, that we've been peppered with the idea you have to take massive risk for high returns. Listen, I think there is some level of truth to that. But there's still some ways to, to hopefully get some return without having to take on massive risk. I would love I mean, that. If we're, if we're putting out the, the ideal ideal, I mean, how about if something happens to me, you know, to my health or to my life, that somehow that investment can be there and that savings can be there in maybe a, a factor value more that for my family for or for me if I'm sick and I'm unable to. Uh, produce the income that I'm used to producing. So, you know, some uh, somewhat of a partner that's also a, a guide or a, a, a powerful benefactor 
if something in my life changes, is that too much to ask for a uh, for an investment? <laughs> Which is, which is also an interesting time now, too, is we're in some significant inflation uh, challenges, inflationary period of time in our economy. And, you know, always need to keep our money growing faster than that. Right. At least it's somewhat inflation protected or proof. We need our dollars to maintain its value. Right. Because every dollar I keep that's earning less than that that is basically losing money. I want to make sure it's, it has some low inflation sort of proofing to it and can help me maintain the value of my, my dollars. And, and obviously the one thing I, I, I do want to make sure uh, my dollars are, there's some, I have more control over it. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also in a lot of ways, I like it private. Like how do I use my dollars that aren't always subject to government regulations and rules to it that I feel like I have more control and it's um, something that I can, you know, not have to worry that, uh, you know, the government's going to take it, right? Yeah. That's mine, right, in my family's. Well, we mentioned taxes already, and here we are, you know, a month from April 15th. And, uh, you know, imagine imagine a place to store your money where you don't even get notice around filing taxes and, and reporting what you've made that year. I mean, that, that, that's, a rare, that's a rare asset. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these are all great, and I think, you know, in an ideal, I wish wish this was was available, and and you know, maybe this is you know it's too good to be true, something like this. But these these are some of the major characteristics a dividend paying whole life insurance policy, and it's incredible to think because you know it has such a, 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 a as a product, and and obviously when we're talking about IBC and if in banking, we're talking much more of a. The, the, the whole life being a, a platform for the process and strategy. But it's, we want to share this because it is one of those areas I think is really heavily misunderstood. And, you know, probably the vast majority will have a negative opinion of it because they don't have never actually seen it and understood it. And so these are, are some of the core elements of what a good whole life policy looks like. And the one that maybe is 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 typically said, but there's no rate of return on these these policies. They're the worst investment ever. Who says that all the time, right? Yeah. Um, all the talking heads and yep. But earning you know somewhere in the range of four 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 plus percent in a tax deferred and can be tax free environment that that's equivalent to earning maybe maybe six percent maybe you know, on a pre-tax, six, 7% pre-tax is not a bad return for something that has no risk of loss, right? right? And it's guarantees with it and all, all those other elements. So to put it in perspective, it's a good, in my mind, good balance between re- return and risk. Yes. And then th- that's just holding it in there. And as you said, the, the mutual whole life insurance policy has many of those characteristics that we just put forward as kind of the ideal. But the way the infinite banking concept strategy works is sort of the way life works in that as we're living our life, we've got all sorts of financial needs. We've got, uh, or I I should say, we've got asset desires that are going to take finance to get them. There's one thing to pay for the electricity every month, that's going to come out of cash flow from your income and provide for, you know, the house. But how about a car? How about a big piece of equipment? How about a home? Things like that take finance. And imagine having something that'll grow for you in those times when you don't have the uh, immediate need for financing, but you can access to then pay cash for different uh, types of assets uh, or investments that you want to take on because you see the need or the um, opportunity. So all of a sudden, a good return over time left alone can become a phenomenal return based on what you're able to do with that money at the time that you need it and you see opportunities arise for you in your life. Is that is that a, a little too complicated or should we kind of flesh that out a bit? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, I think it's, um, you explained it well, because I think if you understand the storage aspect of what the whole life uh, platform can do, that, 
you know, that need for financing throughout life is our biggest need. And so we're either going to pay cash for things, right, through our cash flow, or we're going to borrow it, right, from an institution. So in the, the concept of infinite banking is that we have set up our own storage bin of money that we now have um, the ability to leverage that to borrow against that that asset from the life insurance policy com- and company to finance life, right? Yeah. While our money continues to grow. And so it does require a slight change because even myself personally used to think paying cash for everything was the ultimate. I never experienced an interest charge. So I felt like I was getting ahead, right? It was a smart way to do it. But I've come to realize that our cash has a cost to it. A financing cost. And yes. what is that? It's the money that stops earning because I'm using my cash, yeah. right? I could earn more and put it to work. So we just have to balance this. But now we have a vehicle and a process that helps us to control it, right? And use our wealth uh, more efficiently to finance, like you were describing, Chris, everything in life from purchases to investments, if we understand how it works. Yeah. And we've used that term loan a number of times. So the, the way the strategy works is you're putting money away into this vehicle that you've chosen. And it, it, it matters your age and your health and things like that. But once chosen, you set up a contract where you as the premium payer really have that one responsibility to put the premium into the contract. All the other responsibilities around guarantees and growth and taxes are the insurance company's uh, side of the bargain. So you've got a, a really powerful, large partner, but one that's really have to has to follow most of the uh, different rules of the contract. And that'll grow, as we discussed. But then when we go to access the money, typically, let's say when we're under 70 years old, we'll typically be accessing that money by borrowing from the insurance company using our policy as collateral. So just like you use your house as collateral for a mm-hmm. mortgage loan, you use your, your life policy as collateral to borrow from the insurance company that you have your policy with. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't, you know, why do I have to borrow for my own money? Well, there's there's two things about that. One is your own money there in the policy continues to grow. So that is continuing to add to your wealth. Now, the second thing is the loan rate you're paying to the insurance company with your policy as collateral is going to be right around plus or minus a little bit what you're growing at in your policy. Again, it depends on age. It depends on health, things like that. But what I love about the fact that you have to pay, and I'm a practitioner myself of of this with my own policies, is that I want to see ways to get that money back to the insurance company as it continues to grow in the policy. Because an interest rate, the borrowing rate, is almost like a magnet that wants me to pull money from wherever I've invested it or wherever I've, I've purchased an asset with it or what have you to pull out of that or out of new money that I'm making in my income and get it back into the, into the insurance company's hands so that that interest rate stops. The opportunity has been exploited. I've made some money on the investment or I've used the asset that I needed at that time. If you pull money out of a checking account, since it doesn't have that connection of an interest rate, it can tend to just stay out forever and and you just don't grow your wealth as well. But borrowing from your policy, at the outset, it sounds like a bad thing, but in practice, it's the thing that draws the money back into the policy or back into the insurance company so that that policy can start, uh, can continue, not start, but continue on its growth path towards a greater and greater compounding. And you and I talked about what a 4% return can do. I mean, you can double your money four times over your lifetime, uh, just sitting on its own. Whereas a 1% return in a bank, 
it won't double your money even once in a lifetime. All right. No, and and the really, and it, that itself is a, a extremely powerful concept for people to to really come to grips. We've, we've always heard around the importance of compounding, compounding interest, and the power of that. And especially when we were thinking about you know for people who have adopted this, they really think long term, and that's one of the principles of of IBC. You got to think long term about things. We can get so short-sighted on what's the next investment that I can make the most in the next month or two. Well, that's really a very short-term thing. And there might be sometimes need for that, but this is very much in the the mode of thinking very long-term, just like your forest analogy um, and and what's sort of built through this, through through Nelson's sort of history. But the really key important, which I I love too, outside the compounding, is the control of the loan. Right. And and this is a really powerful tool when people understand it. We're so accustomed to having to apply for, for financing and loans. We go through all the paperwork. The last when's the last time you signed for a mortgage, the amount of information and paperwork, and you may not even get it. Right. Yep. This is a guaranteed uh, provision within the contract. So you, you, you can add, and you don't have to apply for it. And it's a guaranteed portion to get that money. And then when you want to pay it back, you can control when you pay it back. Right. Imagine you stop paying your mortgage. You think you're going to get a call? Of course you will. Yeah. Right. So this is a, the type of control, flexibility and freedom we're looking for our lives and our finances. And that's what really draw it drives me to it. Outside of that piece of it, though, is, you know, the I think you touched on earlier, Chris, is, you know, we can get so focused in, in the financial world of accumulation. Right. We're accumulating assets that someday we get to use. When we're in retirement, right? And this, this whether we agree with the concept of retirement, it is a, a big thing in, in our uh, uh, society of people are striving for that. And so what we're taught to do is accumulate, accumulate assets and things that we can't even potentially use right now without penalty, right? They're kind of locked up in, in places like a 401k plan. And, and this is basically what the financial institutions want us to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they get to use our dollars while they sit there for us to eventually use. IBC is different. This is about utilization of our money. Right. We put money in and then we get it to work, whether through financing of purchases. But more importantly, I think in the investment side, getting our dollars to do more than one thing, store wealth, protect us and then put it to work in investments in anything, businesses, real estate, etc. But really helping to grow our wealth and accelerate it. Chris, you have anything to add to that? Oh, I just I just completely agree. And and the the partnership we've talked about a few times with a large mutual insurance company, multi-billion dollars, they are able to take our premium money, our deposits and our cash value and make the returns that are uh, four or five percent, six percent are, are are still and throughout the zero percent uh, period of 2019 through really all the years uh, post uh, banking crisis, we were close to zero percent, and um, and the, these mutual insurance companies paid dividends that um, their balance sheet grew at you know roughly you know six percent at, at maybe, let's let's call it five percent at, at its low point throughout that entire period. So yeah, you've got this um, this engine working for you. But then total freedom to take the money if you've got a better opportunity for yourself. So you've got a, a powerful partner that keeps the the growth operation going while you're focused on your, your job, your family, you're growing your business, whatever it might be. But then when you see an opportunity, they're more than happy and contracted by the contract itself to hand over that money to you so that you can go use it for some period of time to to really find outstanding uh, returns. And and Nelson used to say something um, a lot that said that was something like paraphrasing uh, when you've got the capital opportunity comes knocking. So all of a sudden uh, he was also a, a, a pilot all of a sudden a plane would come on the market that had to be liquidated because perhaps it had its own mortgage attached to it, its own loan attached to it. And the owner just just had no other alternative but to get rid of it. So all of a sudden you get a plane 
for what would have been, uh, you know, maybe double that price a year prior, but it's a, a, a problem situation with an individual or with the economy or what have you, and you're able to get it and, and get him the money he needs at that moment in time. And all of a sudden you're using your plane for transport or for cargo or, or, or for enjoyment. And, you know, a year goes by, two years go by, and all of a sudden you can sell it for that, that double the price and, and back goes the money into the policy. The insurance company uh, is continuing to work for you with your own cash value. Uh, but now they can go find another asset because you've used that borrow uh, for a really profound opportunity. So there's a lot of flexibility. And um, when you have capital, uh, oppor opportunity comes calling. I've seen it myself and Nelson said it all the time. Absolutely. I, I truly believe that. I have many case studies on that just personally and, and for others that I know. So, so to wrap up this, this section, I know we, we talked a lot primarily around like what is it? infinite banking, what is the infinite banking concept and give you some, some high level details really at its heart. It's a, 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 a different warehouse to store your, your dollars, right? That ha has potentially a whole host of other benefits than what we are traditionally used to in a, a typical bank and provides a, 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 a unique financing arm that we can control to finance everything in life. And our, our, it's, it's not just about insurance. There is insurance to this, but the financing component is a hugely powerful aspect of it that really drives this concept to help us have a more efficient cash flow management system, really, that we can help manage our entire financial lives from personal to business. Um, we're going to go into a whole host of that as part of this series, and we'll go through the depth of, of, of how it works and, and where you can apply it to your personal and professional lives. And so really, really uh, excited for the rest of these, these podcasts. And Chris, I, I really appreciate you coming along for the ride and helping to shed your light and, and expertise around this and, and hopefully shed some, some light on a, a powerful tool and strategy to you know, give more freedom and control to people's lives and, and certainly their finances. So uh, Chris, any last party shots on, on uh, the first uh, episode? Yeah, I, I, I loved it. I, I certainly look forward to future ones. I know uh, at, in the next time we talk, we will we'll talk a little bit about illustrations. That's a very important conversation because that's just an estimation of what the insurance company is making now projected out into the future. And there are always guarantees built into illustrations, but the actual numbers that uh, oftentimes uh, people will speak with you about when you're starting to get involved in the infinite banking concept are really just estimates. And, and it's a very important to talk about what you're guaranteed and then what you should expect. And that then comes to, uh, you know, who you're partnering with. And so that, that'll be a little, little preview of, uh, of the, the next time we talk. And um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to uncovering and, and delayering uh, an area which I don't think is that desperately um, difficult to understand, but certainly has a lot of, a lot of uh, I don't know, history and, and baggage around it that um, it's worthwhile to, to unpack and, and uh, look forward to doing it with you. Absolutely. And I, and I agree. There's, we can sometimes uh, overcomplicate something that's simple. And, and certainly with the infinite banking concept, uh, the product of whole life is the platform that allows us to, to create this process and strategy. And we're just hopefully going to be here to help you at least dissect it and understand it for yourself and um, hopefully simplify it so you, um, for those who are, this is a good fit, it really could add some tremendous value to your life. So we'll definitely see you on the next episode. Looking forward to it. Thank you much, Tom. Take care. So thanks for listening to this podcast and hope you're enjoying this series on the infinite banking concept. Next up is part two, how IBC works. In addition to the podcast, I would highly encourage you to get the book Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash. If you want to discuss how IBC can enhance your financial life, feel free to book a free call with our team. We'd be more than happy to help. Visit perennialpride.com to book your call.